Good morning, everyone. It's good to see you today. I'm very glad you're with us. We've been planning that you'd be here, by the way, and hoping you'd show up as well. Uh, my name is Wayne. I'm part of the pastoral team here. I have this official title that I don't really know what it means, that I'm the executive director of Disciple Heritage Fellowship. Um, I have no idea exactly what that means, but nonetheless, I get to spend some time with you this morning and say hello and welcome to the conference. We have some sweet times planned together for the next two days. Uh, I've, um, as I think about this ministry called Disciple Heritage Fellowship, I've been at most, if not I think probably every conference in DHF's history going back to 1986. We really started in 85, but I think our first conference would have been in 1986, and I've been at all of them, I think, probably along the way, usually um, lead, helping lead worship or something or other. And uh, today, though, I get to t put on a different hat and not just be back there on the piano, but to actually have a few words with you. Um, 1986, uh, looking around the room, I can see some who remember 1986, but there are some in the room who weren't even born then. <laughs> it's just scary. Uh, it's a long time ago now, um, and, and, and I would say if you, weren't, if you were born after 1986, after we started this group together, I would say uh, from the perspective of world, the world, maybe you, you didn't miss so much. You did miss the Cold War. Apparently, we're about to have another one, so you'll catch up on that. You missed some pretty poignant moments in my life, particularly since I started my early life as a musician. So uh, you miss things like the Beatles, if you were born after 86. You probably miss disco mania. You miss some brothers bands, people like the Gibbs brothers. Some of you may recall, what were the Gibbs brothers? What was their name? The Bee Gees, right? The Bee Gees, those, the Bee Gees brothers. You miss the Jackson brothers, the Jackson Five. You miss the Osmond brothers and that other brother group called the Doobies, the Doobie brothers who weren't really brothers at all. <laughs> you miss Jimmy Carter and Ronald Reagan, Margaret Thatcher. Um, uh, you did miss Pope John Paul II, probably most of his ministry. He's dead now, you know. Maybe you don't know that. Uh, as are some of the Beatles, some of the Bee Gees, the, the Gibbs. Michael Jackson is dead. They're all flying with the Doobie Brothers. They're flying somewhere high right now. <laughs> John Paul, though, um, um, from Poland, you may, you may know that, he wore plain shoes, brown shoes. No, he had regular papal robes and hats and all sorts of stuff that spoke of ceremony and pomp and, pomp and circumstance and hierarchy and tradition. But he chose regular shoes in an act of humility. At the time, it was quite controversial. He said, I'm not going to accept the trappings of power and authority, but you should know that something happened in his last act of ministry that shifted that a little bit. See, the last sight we saw of John Paul II in his casket, his last act of ministry, the last moment of power as he lay in his casket in St. Peter's Basilica was this. They put red shoes on his feet in his coffin. And the red shoes indicated that his ministry was done. He was finished. He was kaputz. It was over. So I'm not saying anything here. <laughs> this is not my last act, but it's getting close. Thank you for lots of years of ministry together. By this time in three months from now, I will no longer be leading this ministry. I won't have a role on the DHF board. You all are in charge from now on, and we're in trouble, I can tell, because I know some of you already. So before I wander off into the next chapter of my life and retirement and other ministries, and who knows, I might see you in, in your church in the days ahead as we might move around the country a little bit, I do have a few moments to give you something to think about and to pray, and I, I need to acknowledge that this is not the message that I had planned. I had been thinking about this for many months, and then the war happened, and all of our lives were turned upside down in some way or other. So I have a completely different message for you today than the one that I had initially um, put together. Let, let, me, let me put it this way and start this way. 
that you know that this is the age of selfies. We chronicle our lives with photos taken on our cell phones, uh, taken with, in great moments, in appropriate moments. Sometimes they're happy moments. Sometimes they're really significant. Other times they're mundane, and I want to show you a selfie of me. I took it purposely just a few weeks ago for the sake of this message. Just You can see that I'm on an airplane. It was just after I had boarded a British Airways plane leaving from Poland, from Warsaw's Chopin International Airport. Less than three hours later, I was in Heathrow, London. I had a four to five hour layover there. I got on a plane then, another um, British Airways plane, and flew to um, Dallas, DFW, had a four or five hour layover there, got on an American Airlines plane, and flew home here to central Illinois. The most exciting part was in the Warsaw to London um, leg, I had three seats to myself. Oh, that's a brilliant thing. I have to say that in the nine and a half to 10 hour flight from London to Dallas, I was not so fortunate I was like this all the way. So why did I take the photo? Well, see if you can think with me the scene that I just walked through. The evening prior, the Sunday night, a few weeks ago now, April 3rd, I had dinner with friends of more than 40 years. It was a lovely evening. We had some fine food. We had much laughter, some tears. And the thought was, well, I could stay with one of them or I could stay in downtown Warsaw or whatever the case. But I had a very, very early flight. I didn't want anyone to be responsible for me to get to the airport and all that sort of stuff. I said, there's a Marriott at the, hotel, at the airport. Why don't I just go stay at the Marriott? And then you don't, nobody has to be up at 3 o'clock in the morning to drive me anywhere or anything like that. So I went to the Marriott Hotel where the doors were, well, I can describe to you what it was like. You open the door, the doors open to the hotel. You walked across two lanes of traffic, like one going that way, one going that way, across a sidewalk no wider than this stage, another across another two lanes of like that, and there were the doors to the hotel. It wasn't but maybe 250 yards at the most. The hotel room was modern, clean. The cost was right, $101 to spend the night there, which was pretty good. In an international hotel at the airport, you couldn't beat that. The sheets, can I tell you about the sheets? <laughs> they were crisp. They were white. They were clean. They were, I mean, I, may, I wondered, did somebody iron these sheets? It was brilliant. And they were inviting so much so that when that wake-up call came way before 5 o'clock in the morning, I thought, man, I wish I could have taken a later flight. That selfie and the hours in the hotel and the meal with my friends, swell, wonderful, spectacular, brilliant moments, they were in direct contrast to what I'd walked through in the days beforehand. So I took the selfie just to remind myself, what you've seen is not like what you're living right now. Because for 11 days prior to that, I'd walked through scenes of crisis, fear, and worry, I'd listened to the stories and seen the faces of war refugees in Poland. And here's why I went to Poland. Perhaps you're unaware that our church here in this building said, let's get some money together and do something with it for Ukrainian refugees without really a goal in mind. I thought we might make, seriously, I thought we might receive about $1,200, maybe $2,500. It began to grow very quickly, and then a lot of DHF churches heard what was going on, and the responses were so generous that I, it was, became clear that we had to steward those funds in a significantly different way than just saying to somebody, here's $1,200 or here's $1,500, you know, buy a few meals, because friends, can I tell you that DHF contributed way over $20,000, unsolicited almost. And between that and other churches, do you know that the $1,200 I anticipated as of this week has reached more than $160,000? That's really cool. So thank you for that. And so given that huge number, um, and it continues to grow, um, our church funded a discovery trip for me apart from that money, and I was gone for 11 days. I have many friends from Poland. For, we used to do ministry in Poland 40 years ago. And we were all in our 20s though, then, and now we're in our 60s, and so you get to be 60-some years old. You end up in places of influence, if you will, and that's the case for them in Poland. And I want to know, how can we think long-term? Where can we find places where accountability is in place? And so it was a fast trip through much of Poland, um, hundreds of miles in vehicles. We went up north, up towards Gdansk, up by the Baltic Sea. 
went down south. We went all the way out to the uh, uh, eastern part of Poland, western Ukraine. You can see that city that's circled there. It's Chelm. We would, it's, it's spelled C-H-E-L-M, if you would. So we would say Chelm in Polish. It's Chelm. And I, I, I have sites that will be with me for the rest of my life. And that's what caused me to change my message for today. See, I thought, well, I'm going to give, you know, 40 years of practical advice of ministry, which would be fine. Maybe we can do that another time. But what I saw was in direct contrast, direct disparity between that hotel and those friends and that British Airways plane. I heard stories. Many of them were similar. Women with children who are struggling to meet the needs of their families. They've arrived in Poland with just one or two sets of clothing, winter jackets, and snow boots. With spring about to arrive, their clothing is no longer suitable. Most of them don't have food with them. When you see them, you can see the Ukrainians on the street. Here's why they look shell-shocked at their arrival. Most of them have traveled for days through very dangerous settings with their husbands and fathers and young adult sons left behind for the sake of the army. It is basically from 18 years of age to 60 years of age. You can't, if you're male, you can't get out of the country. There are some exceptions, and we could, but in a broad brush, 18 through 60 men are not allowed to leave. They've left their adult sons, their husbands, their fathers behind. And as they arrive, here's what the story is we heard repeatedly. I got on the train in Warsaw, or maybe east of Warsaw, pardon me, of uh, Kiev. And I was on the train for 18 hours. It was standing room all the way only, because that's how crowded the train was. We would switch out seats. We're holding our children. They're sleeping on our shoulders, on our hips. We got to the Polish border. A woman said, I stood in line with my daughter for five days. They arrive. Some of them have learned of the deaths of their men and their family. And they arrive in shelters completely exhausted, emotionally depleted. And the women sleep for days. But not the children. They've been sleeping on, an, on, re, on a regular basis on the train or whatever. They're not so tired, so they need care as the women sleep. Poland has no refugee camps. Jan was with me. Jan playing bass here. Um, we were together. We, uh, on the Monday morning after we arrived, we walked into... Um, well, you know what, do you know what a warehouse setting would look like if it was for like a showroom for a car show or for a technical show or a home goods show? On the outskirts of Poland, there's five or six of them, huge facilities. And I remember Jan and I walked in there that morning, 30,000 cots. People arrive on the buses from the border, chartered by the government. They're handed, paper, handed papers, work permits. They get a blanket and a pillow, and uh, they sleep. The government has contracted with a friend of ours, a, man, a gentleman named Mariusz, and they've said, hey, we need you to figure out what to do with all these children who, while their mothers sleep. So they are building, um, very quickly, daycare centers, playgrounds inside the warehouses. They talk to IKEA. IKEA has a facility, a factory in Poland that um, has 8,000 employees. And so IKEA said, we're going to stop our production line of Ikea furniture, and we're going to simply, for the next while, make furniture for children, for all these. Because you know how many children there are? Between 700,000 and a million children. For the sake of the children who have experienced war, the Israeli government, who has some experience with war trauma and children, they have Ukrainian-speaking teams that are arriving and doing two-week stints in rotation, dealing with the children with this question in mind. What did these little ones see that might impact their psyches in the days ahead? I had, um, in, in one of the daycares that we went into, in one of the warehouses, um, the children had been involved in doing art, and I went up, and, and, and the art was on the wall, and this one caught my attention because it was in uh, English. And uh, it was very clear. It says, I love my home. My home is Ukraine. And um, I looked at it, took the photo that you see right there, and then a couple days later, Mario should see me sent, looking at it, and he sent it to me and said, hey, you should probably have this and take this home. So I must tell you, 
Beyond just giving you a report, if you will, about Ukrainian refugees, can I ask this question of all of us here today who are Christ followers? In light of the crisis in Europe, what would Jesus say we should do in any setting like that? What would Jesus expect his followers to do considering the war in Europe, considering the violence and the refugee crisis there, and, of course, in other parts of the world? What's our responsibility? Uh, you probably know this already, that the church, individual congregations, and individuals, we have a responsibility to express God's care for humanity in two basic methods. We're to provide frontline care for people in need, and then we're to provide long-term care that would lead to evangelism, to individuals converting from non-faith to faith, from non-Christian to Christianity. Jesus makes this very clear. There's some statements that he made throughout his ministry that point this out. Can I point out a couple of them? The first one that I want you to see is from Matthew chapter 25. It's a story where Jesus is telling what's going to happen when you, my followers, and the people around, what's it going to be like at the great judgment? And he says there's going to be this moment where the people are going to be divided, and it's going to be based on, what's it going to be based on as to who is on his right and on his left, and sheep from goats, and all that sort of stuff? In other words, Jesus gives a future scene, a final judgment scene in eternity, and says, Jesus is going to say, come, you who are blessed by my Father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. Here's why you get to come into the kingdom. I was hungry, you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. And apparently, Jesus says that in that final judgment scene, the ones who are saying, hey, I'm getting some inheritance, I'm getting into the kingdom, I'm getting, how, when, did I, when did we ever see you hungry or thirsty or naked or in need? And Jesus is going to reply, he says, Whatever you did for the least, you did for me. Jesus didn't mince words. Apparently, God is watching over how you and I respond to people in need. The needs that you may recall are mentioned by Maslow. Do you remember that guy? Okay, some basic human needs. A hierarchy of needs he put together. And the basic human needs are personal well-being and food and clothing and shelter and he goes on about how you've got to deal with that. And from a Christian perspective, what would you say? That you've got to take care of those personal well-being and food and clothing and shelter needs before you can talk to people about matters like education or belonging or wealth or even Christian spirituality. Jesus said to take care of those people who have basic needs. That's frontline care. Christians are supposed to care for people in need. I'll tell you, this has been a driving force, if I could be, be sort of personal about our church, it's been a driving force for our congregation for more than 20 years now. We were faced with a question that changed our ministry focus in the early 2000s. We brought in a consultant to say, how could we grow? How could we do some things that are maybe different and would set, you know, plan for the future? And I remember it was 11 o'clock in the morning on a Saturday morning, he asked this question. If First Christian Church disappeared overnight... Would anyone other than the members notice? Would the community be concerned? And he left the room. It seemed like a really unfair question to ask and then to walk away. I, I remember looking around the room, elders, staff members, going, well, what's our answer? And our honest assessment at more than 160 years of ministry in this church was, if we died tomorrow, People wouldn't notice. Oh, yes, as a congregation, we're absolutely interested in evangelism. Very much so. We want, to, we want people to follow Jesus. To, beyond it, our mission is to make devoted disciples of Jesus by, by causing them to become devoted followers of Jesus by growing and serving together. I mean, that's our mission. But telling a hungry person to become a Christian without first addressing the hunger issue is sinful. Sinful, Wayne? Yeah. Jesus said, meet their body's needs first, and then talk to them about following me. So we changed how we do ministry. We intentionally began running towards some struggles in our community and around the world. 
We realize we can't take on every matter of concern, but we could impact some settings, some people, for the sake of Jesus' name. So, why did we raise money for Ukrainian refugees? Why did I go to Poland? Why did DHF respond so well? Because I think somewhere deep down in our gut, we know that if there's a mess that we can address, we should go there. We'll care for the least of these because that's what Jesus expects of us. Here's how I saw that happen in Poland in regards to Ukrainian refugees. Jan and I traveled around the country, and um, uh, that was like Saturday through Saturday. And then uh, on Sunday, um, we were invited to go play as musicians in a church um, about 90 minutes south of Warsaw. And the band in that church is perhaps best one of the better-known Christian bands in the nation. And they needed a bass player and a keyboard player for the weekend. Hello, here we are. <laughs> Their music is very similar to, your, to our style. Some of the charts that we read, or the music things, the, the notation, were songs that we'd, I'd played before. We sing them in our church. Of course, they were in Polish. At one point in the service, though, um, the music director had said, now, Wayne, you're going to need to play an underscore. An underscore is when uh, you're, the keyboard player just plays something sort of quietly while there's some talk going on on the stage, if you will. And, and she said, so we're, we've got a bunch of Ukrainian refugees here in the church, about 200 of them, and we're going to invite a couple of the Christian families on stage. And in this case, one man was, a, was between the two families. And they're going to come on stage and they're going to pray for Ukraine. I'm playing away. They get on stage, and the man prays. Then his wife prayed. And then the microphone got passed down the line to a little nine-year-old girl. Do you know what she prayed? She prayed not for the children of, of Ukraine. She prayed for the children of Poland, saying, God, I pray that the children of Poland will thank you for the days when they have their fathers close to them. Would you be with my dad in the army? I must tell you, friends, it was emotionally overwhelming. You, you know, you, if you've played long enough in those settings, you know that you could probably do it with one hand. I needed to play with just my right hand. I took my glasses off, and I pushed my eyeballs into the back of my head, saying, don't sob right now, because you'll really make a scene. The people that you just saw in that photograph are part of the least of these referenced by Jesus. And many of the dollars that you gave and others gave for Ukrainian refugees are being directed to the least of these, particularly Ukrainian children. The Polish government is providing those daycare centers for pre-K kids so that their mothers can go then go to work in Poland. If, if, you, if there's only one parent, somebody's going to take care of the kids if the mother wants to go to work. So they said to uh, some friends, we'll supply the buildings and teachers, but we, we, need, to pay, we need to feed them. And uh, they've done some cost accounting, and it's $4 a day for breakfast, lunch, and a snack before the kids go home. So we gave them a bunch of money. We gave them your money, if you don't mind. We do frontline ministry. But while we do that in Jesus' name, be mindful there's an, also an intentionality in how Christians should approach this frontline ministry. It goes back to another statement Jesus made about this second aspect of the ministry do, the work we do to lead people be, to become followers of Jesus. We said that the folk, Christians focus on two aspects of ministry, frontline care and then straight-up evangelism. We take care of basic human needs for this life in order to talk to people about eternal life. Here's how Jesus put it. Matthew chapter 28. You're familiar with this. Jesus came to his disciples and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely, oh, by the way, guys, by the way, folks, as you do this, I'm with you always to the very end of the age. This is considered to be what we call Jesus' Great Commission. It's one of the last statements he made after his resurrection, before he went to heaven. It's about evangelism. It's about conversion, about moving people from non-Christian to Christian. And this Great Commission is a command from Jesus. It's a directive. It's not a suggestion, hey, when you, get, when you kind of feel in the mood, 
when it sort of is popular, when it's easy, um, if the mood hits, will you tell others about me? And maybe, even if they're not Christian, maybe that would... Uh, no, he said, and he didn't say, if it's convenient, you might want to get other nations involved. No, he didn't say that. Based on his authority, Jesus says, based on my resurrection power and authority, go to every nation. And that commandment has been the rallying cry of the church. Because anyone without a relationship with God through Jesus Christ is our target audience. We have a big audience. Jesus said, go make disciples of all nations. I would suspect we have some Greek scholars. or We have Logos people who know how to use computers, at least. If seminary was about more than about 18 months ago, you go, oh, Greek, Greek, Greek. What, what? Is that going forwards or backwards? <laughs> oh, Hebrew is the one going the other. <laughs> There's an interesting thing about that nation's business that we don't see in English. Some of you may know this. The Greek word for nations right there that Jesus uses is ethnos, which basically means people group, ethnic group. You can see the word ethnic in it, can't you? Jesus is referring to each individual, unique ethnic nation. And there are a variety of ways that you could assess how many ethnic groups there are, but missiologists would say, simply based on languages alone, there are about 11,000 different people groups across the globe. And 11,000 different languages worldwide. It's estimated, by the way, through surveys that are very recent, that some 2,000 do not have any version of the Scripture in their language. So that we know this, then, that at least there are still a lot of people who have to hear the story of Jesus Christ. Some 2,000 people groups who still need to hear, who still need to have someone go to them as Jesus commanded. Now, a note that you might think about, about these 2,000 people groups, this ethnos business. Jesus used that word, ethnos, on another occasion. He was asked about what was the end of time going to look like. He said, his disciples said, how will we know when, when, when you're coming back? And Jesus indicated, well, in the moments before it, it might be a little bleak. He said, you'll hear of wars and rumors of wars, but don't be alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still yet to come. Notice this. Wars and rumors of wars sounds familiar, but the end of time is not there yet, he says. Nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There'll be famines and earthquakes in various places. But still, that's not the end of time, the beginning of Jesus' reign. You'll be handed over to be persecuted, put to death. You'll be hated by all nations because of me. At that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other. Many false prophets will appear, deceive many people. But that's still not the end of time, Jesus' second coming. And then he gives the clue. This gospel of the kingdom will be preached to the whole world as a testimony to all nations. There's the word, ethnos again. And then the end will come. In other words, apparently what Jesus is telling us is that a key determinant regarding his second coming is not the wars and the rumors of wars or persecution against his followers. Instead, Jesus' second coming is based on all nations hearing his story. All people groups, all languages will hear, and then God's kingdom starts a new chapter. Now, I don't want to rush the scene. I don't want to go do Bible translation so I can get Jesus to come here more quickly. But I was to, what are we doing about the 2,000 people groups? Jesus said, go to them. Well, one aspect of hearing Jesus' story in all people groups includes hearing and reading the scriptures in their own languages. We said there are some 2,000 different people groups who don't have the scriptures in their language. And you go, 2,000? We started with 11,000 when there's still 2,000? We're never going to get there. Two, we started with 11,000 when Jesus was alive, and now we've still got 2,000 left to go? Well, can I tell you? Yeah, there were 11,000 some 2,000 years ago. We, missions work, and translators had shifted that to 5,000 in 1980. A little over half had been done by 1980. But did you know, in the last 40 years, it's gone from 5,000 down to 2,000. We're speeding up through the use of computers. And I've got some really cool news for you today. Those 2,000 languages, those 2,000 unreached people groups, the 11 major biblical translation ministries across the world got together. They surveyed the 2,000 groups. They discussed, they prayed, and they planned. And here's the plan. 
that by 2050, all languages, all 11,000 languages will have the beginnings of Jesus' story written in their language. So in other words, if you can see yourself alive just a mere 30 years from now, or 28 years, 2022 to 2050, if you can see yourself alive in that period of time, you will see, in my opinion, the most major development of, in all of Christendom's history will take place. For the first time in human history, for the first time in Christian history, Jesus' story will be available to all people. We want you to see what that looks like if you go in the East Auditorium today. Pioneer Bible Translators, one of those 11 translators and ministries, has a display that shows a portion of their task of the 2,000 languages yet to be translated. They have 200. They're underway, and they've already, they've already got the funding for the 200 languages that they're responsible for. They're on track to get all their 200 started, not by 2050, but eight years from now, by 2030. I want you to check out their display. It's huge, and it's set up in the East Auditorium. I saw it for the first time just a couple of months ago, and I basically begged them, can you get it here somehow or other so that the people of DHF can see what an incredible moment is about to happen in the story of Christianity? Because if you don't have the Scriptures in your language, what is the, how, how do you read the Bible? What if the Bible was not written in your language? Would it look like this? The first time I saw this was over a dinner table at a restaurant just north of here in up in Forsyth. And talk about stunned talk about understanding the gift that has been given to me. I have more Bibles in my life than I know what to do with in terms of copies. And yet for many, that's their Bible. So why am I mentioning this? Well, frankly, I have a concern. I want to form my concern, if you will, as the executive director of Disciple Heritage Fellowship, as a fellow who's been around with this since the, early, since the mid-'80s. Here's my concern. Have many congregations lost their way regarding an awareness of global missions? The go part of Jesus' Great Commission is exactly that. It's a commission. And I get concerned that churches, perhaps your church, has stopped being involved in overseas work. Does your congregation have a consistent, established, intentional, focused ministry regarding other nations? You don't have to take on every nation, but are you doing something? Yes, work in your community. Care for the least of these. Jesus said to do that. But what are you doing about international work as a congregation? I'm aware. Can I say this with great gentleness? Please, hear me. Hear me. I, I'm aware that some of our churches, some of our congregations, are accustomed to sending money to denominational headquarters and then thinking, we've done our part. We're sending stuff away. Have you ever asked, though, are those funds being used for the sake of Jesus' name, leading other people to become disciples of Jesus Christ? Uh, is the go and make disciples portion of Jesus' great commission fulfilled in how those dollars are used? That's a question you must ask. And so perhaps it's time for a new global mission focus for your congregation. We'd like to help you with that. We have some best practices of how that can work. If you're saying, we don't even know where to start. We've got some ideas, all right? At least some ways that you could get started. Uh, uh, maybe I could frame it this way. Because there might be a little bit of shifting in how church manages funds and thinks about missions. Some might recall, this is really ironic to me, that um, last year, when I was in this same pulpit, in this same conference, uh, we chatted about a ship that got stuck in the Suez Canal just as the conference was getting underway. Can I remind you of the story in case you weren't there? Because there's been a new development that is just too much that I can't let, I can't let it go. The Evergreens Given ship is as long as the Empire State Building is high. And on March 23, 2021, it was a very bad day. 
they should write a book, A Very Bad Day for the Captain and the Crew of the Ship Called the Given. It could be a children's book, The Very Bad Day of March 23, 2021, for the crew and the captain. As they were moving into the Suez Canal, a windstorm came up, and all the containers on top of that ship acted like one big sail, and they could not stop the direction of the ship. The next thing you knew, they were grounded with the bow and the stern stuck crossways in the, in the Suez Canal, and international shipping came to a halt, and international shipping rates went sky high. Here's why. Apparently, once a ship is moving, a big, large ship like that is moving in one direction, if to turn the thing around takes a mile and a half, actually 1.8 miles for it to be able to turn around and go in the other direction. The inertia of traveling is simply too strong, and once you get the wind behind it, you're in trouble. We talked about, I use that as an illustration to say, if you want to turn your church around, you can, we, you can do it, absolutely can, but be mindful, it's going to be hard. Don't think it's easy, but you can do it. Well, bless their hearts. Once again, in time for the conference this year, the Evergreen shipping firm is in trouble again. Just, I mean, the irony, you can't make up this sort of stuff. It's so fortuitous for my message year after year that this year they ended up with another container ship stuck in the mud in Chesapeake Bay of all places. Not in the Suez Canal, but here in the U.S. And this time it wasn't the Evergreen, the, the Ever Given, pardon me. It was the Evergreen's Ever Forward. <laughs> the Ever Forward. Are you kidding me? It's not going anywhere. What an ironic name that it can't go forwards or backwards. And it was in the mud for weeks. It was stuck in Chesapeake Bay for five weeks. Count them. You've been wondering why that new couch you ordered hasn't arrived yet. <laughs> it's sitting in the holds of that ship. And hopefully by the time it gets to you, they will have at least been able to hose off the mud off the legs of that couch. Salvage tugs and all kinds of ships and barges worked for weeks, pushing, pulling, and they wouldn't move. They dredged around the ship, hoping to get the mud, and the mud just, the mud sucked. So to speak. <laughs> you know what they had to do? 5,000 containers on board, they have to, had to offload more than 500 of them onto other barges, put them on land at Baltimore, and then when the high tide came along just last Sunday, a special spring high tide of some sort, they got the ship to float free. Here's my question. Is it feasible your church is stuck in the mud regarding Jesus' great commission? You got great intentions of going places, but you're just stuck. Are there some things you need to offload, some dead weight that needs to be offloaded? Do you need to rethink how to get going in the direction Jesus expects? Because these are Jesus' followers. Jesus' followers go to places where his story is still basically unknown in international global endeavors where we go to make disciples of all nations. What do we do? We baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and then we teach them to obey everything he commanded. We go to those who don't yet follow Jesus with the express purpose of getting them to follow Jesus. And yet, we still care for the least of these as well. It's twofold. We go to the unreached, and we care for the least of these. Last month, on your behalf, we reached into people's lives simply to express Jesus' love and touch. That's why I went to Poland. That's why you gave money, lots of it. And so I want to say thank you. Thank you on behalf of people you've never met. Thank you to, on behalf of people who receive care in Jesus' name because of your, your generosity. What did I learn? I saw some sights that caused alarm. The images of the warehouse full of cots, that, that, they're instilled in my memory. That'll never go away. I saw the joy of children as they were involved in those hastily built um, daycare centers. I smile for the joy of them. I smile for the messes they made. And I cry for the reason that they are not in their own homes, in their own schools, in their own beds. I need to tell you, friends, your brothers and sisters in Christ in Poland are doing a remarkable job. Individual congregations are making a difference. 
For example, there's a church just 15 miles from the border, Helm. I mentioned it. It was the circle on the map. It's the first church on the highway, if you will, of any size. But it's not a big church. It's a church of 150 people. Yet they're caring for refugees. They're caring for children. When I sat down with their pastor, he said, uh, at that point, about six weeks into the war, we've taken care of 3,600 people. They've slept in our sanctuary since February 24th. We either put the pews together, allowing them to sleep there, or we put mattresses on the floor. 180 people per night. We're planning for three meals a day. Their kitchen is not set up for that sort of cooking. It's one thing to have a fellowship dinner in, in, a, in a small building, but three meals a day for weeks on end? They didn't have refrigerators or freezers or a budget for that. They needed help. The Ukrainians arriving have only the clothes on their back, and therefore their clothes have to be washed more often, but they didn't have washing machines. So I gave them $6,000 of your money. And I met children, dozens of them. They are refugees removed from their homes, removed from their fathers, removed from the nation. They are the least of these that Jesus spoke. I must tell you, friends, the emotions are overwhelming. At times, I'm lost for words except words that say things like this. Jesus, have mercy. These are the least of these you mentioned. And sometimes, we don't even have the words to pray, do we? Sometimes, maybe the best response is to simply sit in silence before God, our spirits grieving and mourning that there are some in this world who are in desperate need and to those people, and for those people said, Jesus said, go. Go.